Science fiction has always been one of the most exciting genres in cinema. But what is the best science fiction film of all time? Is it The Terminator? Is it The Matrix? Is it 2001 A Space Odyssey? Is it Everything Everywhere All at Once? Let's break down the 30 greatest science fiction films of all time. What's up, movie friends? Welcome back to Raiders of the Lost Podcast, the ultimate film and TV podcast. And since Dune Part 2 is absolutely lighting the pop culture zeitgeist on fire right now, we were like, let's talk about what we think are the greatest science fiction films of all time. We talk about sci-fi on this podcast all the time. You all know how much of a, how big of fans we are. We've covered many of these movies in solo episodes and rankings as well. The science fiction genre, I think, allows filmmakers to explore all sorts of cool ideas, themes, as well as really pushing forward the technology of filmmaking. Filmmakers like Stanley Kubrick, like Ridley Scott, and like Denis Villeneuve nowadays were able, have been able to excel how to make movies because the genre allows that. And just a little heads up, we're not going to be doing any superhero movies, nor will we be doing any Star Wars films because they would just litter this list. So we're dominate going it. straight up sci-fi, no superheroes, no Star Wars, no space fantasy like that. So, But there will be space movies on this and there will be movies, lots of aliens on this, yeah, yeah. lots of technology on here. We didn't want to take away from the genre of sci-fi because it would just be so many of those movies exactly. on this list. Plus there's an animated feature on here as Ooh. well too. But I'm really excited about this list. Science fiction is my favorite genre of all time. I love it. Love it because there's so many things you can do. It's also an umbrella genre. It's ambiguous sometimes what classifies science fiction. You don't have to have aliens. You don't have to have technology. Lots of other things kind of... You don't have to have Terminators. You don't have to have Terminators. <laughs> you don't have to have the T-800 or T-1000. You know, science fiction can be something like Children of Men, where something's happened to humanity uh, biologically that has doomed it. Or, you know, something like Under the Skin is a great sci-fi movie. Well, I mean, it's aliens. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You said no aliens. No, I said it doesn't have to be aliens. Yeah, it doesn't have to be aliens. That's, yeah. that's totally yeah. aliens, bro. Yeah, it's very, very <laughs> much aliens. It's very alien-y. Very alien. <laughs> it's the little... Invisible Man is a sci-fi film. Sci-fi sure. horror film. Sure. Yeah. yeah. The new one's in, in a science yeah. fiction horror film. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I completely concur. Wow. I should have concurred. I concur. Now, it was hard to make this list. And we originally were like, let's do 20. Then we were like, let's do 25. Then we were like, let's do 30. <laughs> Because <laughs> I didn't want to leave some of these out at all. You don't want to piss anyone off. And I don't want to piss anyone off. And I didn't want to get any like hate comments. So I think 30 is a good list we got. We got some Pretty great good. films. I this. mean, the entirety of science fiction, you know, 30 films are boiling it down to. And it's interesting what decades are, are hottest, I feel like, for science fiction. Right now it's hot. Well, it's but hot. like the 1980s, man. 1980s, oh, yeah. there's quite a few movies from that era on this list. How about we get uh, kicked <laughs> off with this list, James? Yeah, why don't you take us away, Anthony? Now, to open this list at number 30, we have one of the greatest directors of all time. Someone who built his career with the horror genre and with the science fiction genre. A guy who loves aliens. Steven Spielberg's Close Encounters of the Third Kind, starring Richard Dreyfuss, as long as a great ensemble of other actors. This is a great mystery science fiction movie. Uh, it's an incredible alien movie, and it, it's a beautiful uh, meshing of music and communication uh, with the themes of science fiction. It has nothing to do with uh, battles, nothing to do with violence uh, or destruction. It's more about connecting to another race of beings from uh, another planet. And it's just an incredible mystery that unfolds for two hours where a bunch of these random people around the country, they keep getting visions and they keep thinking about this one area. And this it's just like this one little mountainside hilltop. And they don't know what's going on, but they are so drawn to this one location in the middle of the desert. And Richard Dreyfuss is essentially the main lead of this film who essentially abandons his entire life, his children, his family, because this mystery is pulling him so intensely to itself and it culminates in one of the most memorable climaxes and third acts in science fiction history uh, if you haven't seen it highly recommend checking out close encounters of a third kind it's also one of uh, Steve, uh john williams most beautiful scores yeah it's yeah stunning visually incredibly well made well shot some of the most memorable shots in cinema history like the boy through the doorway everyone yeah. knows that shot it's incredible mm -hmm. but it's a really terrific alien film and it's i like it too it's not the only alien film in this list that deals with just communication mm -hmm. versus just an invasion and yeah. war and destruction. So I really like that aspect of alien films when there isn't always just chaos and mayhem. Yeah. It doesn't have to be. It doesn't have we to be. We can be friends. We can. Why can't we be friends? That's actually what they sing at the end of this movie. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> Moving on to number 29 on the list, we have a movie from 2023, 2022, I mean, but it cleaned up shop at the 2023 Oscars and won seven awards, including Best Picture. I'm talking about everything, everywhere, all at once from Daniel Kwan and Daniel Scheinart. This was the hottest movie of the year when it came out, and this was this blew up social media as much as Doom Part 2 has been doing lately. Everyone loved this movie. I, I think it's aptly rated on our list, though, and it's a 7.8 on IMDb, 94% on Rotten Tomatoes. I think those are really solid scores. It's a really excellent film. It's very original. However, it took a concept that people are obsessed with right now, and Hollywood's obsessed with, with, with the multiverse, and mm -hmm. make a multiverse movie, but grounded in reality of you know a small family and their interpersonal issues, but expanding on that in different dimensions, in different realities, and, and making it the most important thing on the, in the universe in a lot of ways, which is really interesting. And I think it's so well made, it's very creative, it's hysterical, and it's relatable. And it's it starts so simply too. The opening is really terrific, where it's just for about five ten minutes. We're following this family and their 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 small struggles in life that we all have, and then it just expands it expands into this plot that traverses the entire universe. Really cool, unique, interesting technology, hysterical moments, as well as obviously the Shine Arts. I mean, Dan, the Daniels have terrific filmmaking that they brought from music videos and are incorporating that into their feature length films. And this was the hottest movie of 2022 and probably 2023. It's just it's, so it's hot. still it's still on fire, but it, it's a terrific movie, very memorable and really really well loved, especially I think by younger film fans. They really really adore this movie and it's is it still A24's or now their most successful film at the box office? I, I believe it's their most successful now. Yeah, I think it's I believe it, so. It broke like 120 million dollars at the yeah. global box office, which was massive for A24. It's also one of the most emotional films on this list by far. It's extremely emotional. And like you said, it's absolutely hysterical. I would say it's the funniest movie on this list. Possibly. Yeah, it's so funny. Possibly. There uh, aren't a ton of great comedy. science fiction <laughs> films with comedy inside of them. <laughs> if they are, they aren't that good. <laughs> it just doesn't really blend. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Spaceballs is probably the funniest. Yeah, that's what I mean. It's yeah. like a great science fiction with comedy. There's always just elements of, of horror involved. Yeah. All right, next up, at number 28, we have another movie. Getting sick of this guy from Steven Spielberg. <laughs> Jeez, man, make some different kinds of movies. <laughs> we have Minority Report. It's also the first Tom Cruise movie on this list. we got to get Tom over there somehow. Minority Report is, in my opinion, one of uh, Steven Spielberg's least talked about great films. It's a really fantastic science fiction film based on the Philip K. Dick short story. It's a remarkable piece of filmmaking. Great CGI that still holds up with the visual effects. Really interesting concept of being able to say that if you, you're you going to commit a crime, so that makes you guilty. Very interesting concept of pre-crime and stopping someone before they actually commit an act and saying that they commit, they're commit they going to commit that act. So the idea of free will and choice is the huge theme in this film explored really interestingly. It's a great future film that isn't really so much – it's not that dystopian – like Blade Runner, but it has a vibe to it. It seems more grounded in what the future could look like, where not everything is super high tech. And it does feel like it's like a, a very near future, which I always love when the science fiction genre isn't so far away from where we are now. It makes it a little bit more relatable to the audiences. And then uh, Tom Cruise, again, being a perfect lead as John Anderton. I love this film. Incredible action and an amazing, amazing score from John Williams once again. Some of my favorite sequences of all time. Um, some really dark themes explored in this film, a really fantastic movie. What I like about it so much is, obviously, we have this massive new technology that's almost sort of on a different plane, like re like spirituality of premonitions of the future. But then inside that, we have baked in these little spices of other pieces of technology that you said are really relatable today, like the eye scanning technology that picks up your identity wherever you are with the scanners, as well as the cars are really interesting. They seem to be electronic and insanely fast. The holograms that he uses in his house to look at the the videos of his son that he's taken, everything like that, as well as the digital cereal box, things like that. <laughs> or it's just like they're peppered in to make it really feel like a future that, like you said, could be grounded in our reality, what our future could look like, just little, little sprinkles. In, but they add to the world of it being in a, in a near future and mm -hmm. just this new technology. It's really cool. And some of the best cinematography that Janusz Kaminski has done. One of my favorite shots of all time is uh, with Tom Cruise and um, the actress. I'm sorry, her name's escaping me. And they're both looking in opposite directions, but they're holding each other. It's, I think, one of the greatest shots of all time. Whoa! Yeah. That is a bold statement, Anthony. Oh, yeah. One of bing, the greatest bing. shots 
of all time from yep. Minority Report. Mm-hmm. It's a terrific movie. It's it's a unique looking movie, yeah. and it's one of the best science fiction films of the century. Peter Stormare, sure. <laughs> he's great. <laughs> he's great in this movie. Oh man, when he eats the moldy sandwich oh, in, the, in, the in, the, in the in the old sour milk, it's like oh no, just reach up to the other oh, shelf. It still makes me squirm. <laughs> uh, but also those little nano robots that that find him. Spiders, so, yeah. So yeah. like, there's so many little things about technology in this that's really fascinating. Mm-hmm. Let's move on into the next film on our list of the greatest science fiction films of all time. We have another alien movie that deals with communication. We have Contact from 1997 starring Jodie Foster, directed by the great Robert Zemeckis, who is just an all-time director. He really is. Now, Contact is sensational, and it's it's really interesting because we technically – we don't really see the aliens at all. You know, we see versions of the aliens that human beings can accept accept in a lot of ways visually – but also, this movie just deals with is shrouded with so much mystery. Of is she are there really aliens contacting us? What's this this information? So Jodie Foster plays a character who's in charge of the SETI program. Is yes, that, is that that's what it's called. It's a satellite program looking for any communication yeah. in space. And it's her dream to find contact in outer space. There's something her father was also obsessed with as well, and she she wants to make contact with another world and prove that there's life outside of our our planet. And contact does get made, and it's really interesting because. What they pl- what they they send a signal back to Earth, and it was Hitler's, it, speech. Hitler's speech at the Olympic Games in yeah. 1936, I yeah. believe, 1933, and everyone thought it was an act of war, but really it was the first transmission that was sent into outer space, technically from our planet. So it's obviously the first thing that aliens would send back. They don't know that it's a they horrible context, thing. You know, yeah. they don't under- understand the context. They just think that's a, an interesting way to say hello. Hey, this is the first transmission we've received from your planet. We're going to send it back to you in a different way. But then it's about trying to figure out what these aliens want, trying to keep communications up with them, as well as dealing with the elements of religion and spirituality and connecting that to science fiction or, and to aliens. And if if life on Earth, if we're the center of the universe in terms of you know religion and we are the chosen people of the universe, does that mean that if we make contact with aliens from outer space, does that mean all religion is gone? Or does it make religion even more true in a lot of ways? Yeah, it's explored really well with the relationship with Matthew McConaughey's character. Uh, and the, uh, what, another great plot point is the construction of the ship and the, uh, the instruction manual, basically, that they were given as a puzzle to put together to build this ship. Yeah. It's a really fantastic film. It's very emotional. Jodie Foster carries it. It's inspired many other science fiction films. Most notably, I would say Interstellar took a lot from it in terms of the story and the ideas. And... Nolan did his own spin on the ideas of that and themes that I explore in this film. Um, but I love the film. I think it's a really exceptional science fiction film. And it's it, it's up there with Zemeckis' best films right after, like, Back to the Future and Contact, I would say, are two are its two best movies. And it's really a, a standout performance from Jodie Foster's career. It's almost a perfect movie. Mm-hmm. It's just when there's a second ship that's secretly built. Yeah, the failsafe. It's like, the oh, fail it's kind of like, yeah, yeah. it's a plot device. It's like, yeah. oh, okay, of course. It's, it's ready to go, too. <laughs> also, this novel was written by Carl Sagan. The he wrote the screenplay, yeah, too. Yeah, screenplay, too, yeah. Famous yeah. physicist. Yeah. So... Pretty cool stuff. Pretty, pretty cool. All right, next up. At number 26, we have a film from Charlie, I mean, from Michael Gondry, written by Charlie Kaufman, Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind, which, in my opinion, is one of the best screenplays written this century. It's an incredibly genius, brilliant script. Uh, it's about a man who, after Jim Carrey, played by Jim Carrey, who, after his, he's broken up by his girlfriend, played by Kate Winslet, he decides to undergo a procedure that she underwent to erase all of his memories of her. And then we spend most of the film exploring the inner workings of his mind and memories through this dream reality. It's extremely creative. Michael Gondry is a great director, and he used, uh, I don't think, any CGI at all in this film. Uh, It's all practical, unbelievable transitions in set design uh, and production and cinematography and lighting. He really blends together uh, sequences and scenes seamlessly. Uh, Jim Carrey's performance is possibly his greatest and he's a great uh, chemistry with Kate Winslet who's also phenomenal as Clementine I really love Eternal Sunshine and the Spotless Mind great cast Mark Ruffalo Kirsten Dunst in early roles uh, Stellan Skarsgård uh, uh, unbelievable Elijah Wood unbelievable performances all around and uh, it's just such an idea fascinating idea of because pain and grief can hinder us so much and affect us so deeply and really put a, a damper on our lives what if you could erase that grief? What if you could erase that pain 
is that something you would want to do? And I think that's a it's a question that many many people might say yes to. If they could eliminate pain, they would erase the memories of the person who was the source of that pain. But then the the adverse effect is you're eliminating all the good things. And that's what happens with the character played by Jim Carrey of at first it's like, yeah, let's get rid of all the memories of her, but then like when he starts going through the good stuff, he's like, "Oh no, I don't want to forget any of this." But it's too late. And it's a really in- incredible conflict for the character that's never been done before in a movie. It's awesome. Charlie Kaufman's such an interesting storyteller. It's a great script he wrote. And Joel's an, an excellent character because he's, the whole movie is pretty much during this procedure. And we're going through a little bit of a mix of flashbacks to before meeting Clementine, when he meets Clementine, as well as exploring his memory of erasing her, of him, her memories being erased from his mind. It's, it's really fascinating. And it's cool because the technology isn't really the focal point. It's the story. Yeah. Rather than obviously this is a device. We don't have to explain it too much. It's pretty simple. It's interesting. You know, it's a blueprint of someone's mind that they're erasing specific points from. But the technology is not the focus. It's just yeah. this really interesting concept. And I think I, I got the doctor wrong. I don't think it's Stellan Skarsgård. It's, it's Tom Wilkinson. Tom, Tom Wilkinson. Wilkinson. Sorry. Yes. Yes, sir. Excellent movie. Let's move on to an animated film from Pixar. At number 25 on our list of the greatest science fiction films of all time, we have... Wally, which came out all the way back in 2008. Oh, oh my God. goodness. Fuck. Which is a near, pretty much a perfect movie, in my opinion. To, in uh, IMDb, it's got a huge score of an 8.4. 2008. Ron Tomatoes, oh my it's a God. 95%. <laughs> I freaking love Wally. He's so cute. Isn't it your favorite Pixar movie? It's my favorite Pixar yeah. movie, too. And it, it follows Wally, who's this solitary robot, on this distant future on Earth, the year is 2805. And all human beings have left the planet because they've left it so inhabit uninhabitable. There's just trash everywhere. Every city, every inch of land on the planet has just been filled up with trash and garbage and waste. And Wally is a robot whose main function is to clean up trash trash and clean up waste. And he spends his days piling up trash into these little neat boxes and making skyscrapers out of it, basically. <laughs> Until he, you know is visited by another robot on Earth named Evie. Eva. Eva. Sent from Starship Axiom, where all the humans live on the Starship Axiom. And all humans have become insanely lazy, massive. They just sit around in these floating chairs, watching TV, drinking soda, <laughs> eating burgers all goddamn day. <laughs> and Wally, because he's he's been looking for something in his life. He's been looking for inspiration, something beautiful. He collects objects that he discovers as he's picking up his trash every day. Little flowers, little trinkets that he he connects with. And then he meets Eva and he falls in love with her. So he follows her off of Earth to this other Axiom starship across the galaxy and ends up on the starship. It's a really great look at humanity and what we do to the planet in terms of destruction and waste. There's a lot of people here, and there's a lot of waste that we kind of just don't like to think about. We all create a ton of waste every year, every day. We literally brush it under the rug. But Man. we all pretend like, oh, it just goes away into a fairy world that gets disappeared, and, and but we don't really know what's happening to it. The whole entire planet becomes a dump, basically, but we don't really look into where our trash goes, where our recycling goes. If you did, it'd probably make you sick to your stomach. But this movie kind of explores the effects of humanity on our planet, on our big, beautiful planet. And I think it's done so well. And Wally's such a great character. And, and this movie is essentially a silent film for about a half hour. There's really no dialogue spoken. It's just expressions and some dia- and some uh, sound effects from Wally. And it, it's done so well because it, it proves you don't need dialogue to tell a great story. That's always been the case. Even but, to keep kids entertained. Yeah, and it's just – it's so well made. It's beautiful too. And this is the era where – Pixar started moving into digital cinematography with digital lenses, digital cameras, post Ratatouille, and really experimenting with incredible filmmaking from a programming standpoint. And I love Wally. Did Andrew Stanton make this one? This one was made by Andrew Stanton. Nice. Have you heard of him? I've heard of him. Massively successful, five hundred thirty-two million dollars at the box office. Woo! Damn, damn. Pixar movies are always making bank in their prime. All right, next up at number twenty-four, we have. One of the greatest science fiction films of all time and one of the greatest time travel films of all time, The Terminator from James Cameron, starring Arnold Schwarzenegger. I love The Terminator. I think it's a really brilliant film. Uh, It's just one of the most impressive movies on this list 
because of how small of a budget he had to work with, how small of a scale he had to work with. And he made something very impactful that got him, you know, the job to do the sequel to Aliens. And, uh, and since then, he's just been a skyrocketing career of a director. And he's also, you could say, the king of sequels because he made the sequel to this, which is one of the best movies ever. He made the sequels to Alien, which is one of the best movies ever. Uh, Avatar The Way of Water, amazing sequel. Piranha 2. Piranha 2, <laughs> the greatest he's ever done. And he's just like he's just an incredible storyteller, and the Terminator explores so many great themes of science fiction that have become very common. Uh, I would say the biggest one in this film that is done so many times now is the Grandfather Paradox. Uh, I just I think that the Terminator is a perfect film, and since we were kids, it's always been one of my favorite movies to watch. And Arnold Schwarzenegger really defined the role, and this, he became a, obviously a huge superstar because of it, and he earned that. And he was perfect as the Terminator. This movie would not work as well if it wasn't for Arnold Schwarzenegger playing that role. And so he's just as connected to the film's success as James Cameron is. And then Linda Hamilton bringing it in the next film uh, after this. And I just think the Terminator is a wonderful science fiction film. It's so unique yeah. and so epic. And the filmmaking is awesome. Mm -hmm. It still holds up today, even the stop motion stuff. Yeah. It still looks really great. Oh, it, that ending. I love the it. The ending, yeah. but also even through the doorway yeah. of the Terminator, like walking down. It's, it's so epic. And I awesome. was terrified of the crawling one. Yeah. Yeah. The explosion at the end of the, the third yeah. act is sensational. And the miniature work in the opening is still like, fantastic. Like really, when the chase starts. Yeah. Oh my, well, I mean, Fucking the whole movie is kind of a chase, but yeah. you know. Yeah, what that, I mean? that after the, the truck, the crash. main truck, yeah, yeah. The explosion. It's epic, man. The, it's so suspenseful. Yeah. Incredible stuff. Incredible. And it shows you that, you know, miniatures and models and stop motion, it can work, even even in a movie like this. It still just, holds up. Yeah, even holds the up. fake skull yeah. of Schwarzenegger with the, the eyes. Mm -hmm. It's Obviously, you know, it's a fake head, but you don't care. It still yeah. works. Yeah. It looks great. And great. then the hand moving and with a little mini screwdriver. <laughs> of how simple the tech inside the, For the real. arm is. It's just like he's got a little mini screwdriver. He's just like, like, oh, that's it. That's all we need. <laughs> <laughs> no CGI. And also a scary fact that everyone's address and phone number was public information on phone books you could just walk up to a po like a phone and just find someone's Sarah address Gata. now everyone's so secretive and everyone's so secluded and isolated <laughs> remember our joke a month ago is like if it wasn't for phone books he would have never found her <laughs> <laughs> have you seen Sarah I was Gata? actually thinking about this the other day it's sort of <laughs> maybe a loophole because it depends on how much storage he has on his CPU uh -huh. as a computer because he has all this information of languages and, and weapons, and so he can, like, spot, like, this is that kind of weapon. Yeah. But wouldn't he, like, have the directory of everything? Yeah, the records. The records yeah. of, <laughs> <laughs> like, he would know exactly where Sarah Connor lives. Plot point. It's just, it's, 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 a, yeah. it's a fun, I was thinking about it in the car the other day. I don't know why it popped into my head. I'm like, wouldn't he know <laughs> everything? His CPU's got to be, like, a couple terabytes at least. Oh, hundreds of terabytes, probably. Probably, because yeah. it's the future, and there's yeah. probably a, another storage size that's even bigger than terabyte. I don't yeah. even, maybe there probably is one now. But um, but maybe there aren't digital records of people before the the internet exists. It's a good point. Maybe there weren't any digital records of and addresses and I guess because and of, of Judgment Day, everyone yeah. died. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so actually, interesting take, but... Yeah, I, don't, I think that it still works fine. Yeah, yeah, it works fine. Yeah. It's just one of those things that, because I've seen this movie 30 <laughs> times, and I love it. I was like, I wonder, like, how's he know about these shotguns? <laughs> That's a good point. Yeah. The digitized records. books were digitized. Digitized records had not happened yet. Yeah, exactly. But the digitized records of guns happen? Well, I think there's like, there was like a, in terms of ammunition history. Maybe. That he had that shit. It was magazines. Yeah, yeah. magazines. <laughs> All right, let's move on to a silent film from 1927. We have the iconic, historic Fritz Lang picture, Metropolis. Now, if you ever have taken a film history class or just intro to film, this is probably a movie that you're going to watch in that course because it's that influential and incredible. It's the peak of German expressionism. Expressionism. One of the most prolific eras in cinema history of artistic integrity, exploration, and just great, great innovative filmmaking. And this film follows a protagonist who lives a very privileged lifestyle until he discovers this undercity of the poor and how they're treated. And basically this massive hierarchy of the wealthy versus the extreme poor, this factory-like system, but this this crazy, crazy practical, practically built city of just great miniature work of this future dystopian world of great art 
in architecture, and it's just a fascinating film from a filmmaking standpoint, from a practical standpoint, from cinematography, production design. It's stellar, and basically he's trying to – it's a, a film about rebellion as well. And it, it's a really incredible movie. I guarantee if you if you haven't taken a film course, this is one you, you will watch. And if you're interested in filmmaking, you really should start from the beginning. And this is a movie from the silent era that is probably the most famous and maybe the best from mm -hmm. the 1920s. It's one you have to watch, but it's it's just an incredible movie. Yeah, the visual effects are amazing. And then the, the cyborg woman uh, in the third act is just it's such a powerful moment. It, it looks amazing. It still holds up. Still holds up, man. Still really good. Great stuff. All right, next up, we have another classic science fiction film. It's one of the biggest sci-fi franchises of all time. Franchises. Franchises. Did I say franchises? You said franchises. Franchises. <laughs> <laughs> I love a good French. <laughs> we have Planet of the Apes, the original star of Charlton Heston, which came out in 67. A long, Holy long shit. Long fucking time ago. Long fucking time. And I love all the modern uh, Planet of the Apes movies. They're all fantastic. I just, we almost put... Um, Rise of the Planet of the Apes just almost didn't just did, barely didn't make the cut. Barely, barely. They're excellent. The original is the best one in my opinion, and in your opinion as well. It's a perfect science fiction mil film. It's incredible. It's so shocking. Audiences have never seen anything like it before. It's got one of the greatest twists of all time, and overall, great filmmaking, great practical stunt work, uh, production design, so creative. The prosthetics makeup were ahead of their time and really helped pave the way forward for prosthetics. It's just a really great story. It's about animals and first humans and what is humanity. And I just adore the film. It's dramatic. It's exciting. It's great action, great violence, um, an overall incredible story. There's a reason why they made like eight sequels to this and then, then rebooted it. It's really that great. And also a standout performance from Charlton Heston as, as the lead. He's fantastic in it. It's an incredible concept, a different world where apes – to control of the planet and are the superior beings when it comes to intellect and strength and it's just fascinating and because it's obviously darwinism the evolution of humanity did we come from monkeys did we come from apes what would happen if those apes got super intelligent like us and i think they've done a great job with the reboots of explaining that gen uh, bioengineered mm -hmm. with the biochemicals and yeah i think it's a really clever way to do it but it's also just fascinating to see it from a, a, a standpoint from the 1960s and how they did it back then yeah and just some of the film. most in incredible imagery in cinema history with the Statue of Liberty in a beach, washed up on the shore, basically, yeah. you know, underneath sand. Unbelievable. So good. It's great, great stuff. Yeah. And, and they'll, they're obviously, they're poking fun of that in Deadpool 3 <laughs> with the 20th Century Studios logo. 20th Century Fox. Let's move on to another excellent science fiction film. Excellent. From 2009. Wow. From wow. director Neil Blumkamp, his first film, District. Nine, an incredible movie that still people today are asking for District 10 because this movie's that goddamn good. It's original. It's really fascinating. It's about this spaceship that just arrives on Earth because these aliens have basically they've run out of fuel, right? Yeah. And they're trying to figure out a place to ride out and survive. And then they become refugees. And it's very similar to situations around the world of refugees and specifically South Africa. Because Blumkamp's a South African filmmaker, and this was obviously a, a massive metaphor for what happens there. And it's really interesting to see how humans treat aliens and how it's not so different how humans treat humans it's in terms of being an inferior species. And they don't want really to take care of them. They just dump them off in a massive refugee camp. And it's really great filmmaking style, sort of a mix of uh, typical theatrical filmmaking, fictional filmmaking with documentary style. And Chateau Coplay terrific uh first film right his first, first time he's in, as ever as, as an actor as an actor yeah really terrific performance and untrained I, yeah i think he's a really he's a really terrific actor he, yeah. he's had a great career from not being a trained actor him and blumkamp were friends and worked together and that's how he put him in this role what's great and what's interesting is peter jackson commissioned and hired neil blumkamp to make that 10 minute halo short film back in like 2006 2007 that they were trying to pitch to get a funding for a halo movie it's epic you can watch it on youtube it's really terrific and i really wish that blumkamp got a chance to make a halo movie but he made district nine instead so he's such a talented filmmaker even though he didn't get that they got funding for district nine yeah and i think it's just highly original relevance and relatable and just gr a great concept great alien design great creature design it gets very serious in a in a good way. The tech is awesome, and obviously he's 
he's sort of made his own blend of tech in a lot of the movies he's made. Like Chappie's an example of this sort of rough, gar- like um, sort of garage hyper technology. Yeah. yeah. That I like junkyard Lo-fi tech. Lo-fi tech. Jack, junkyard tech. Yeah. That's what I would call it. Junkyard, junkyard space tech. tech. I like that. Which it's really cool. It's and Elysium too. It's gritty. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And it might be a problem for him though, where a lot of his movies start to look too similar. Yeah. I think that's what's happening. That was the problem with his career. He kept making the same kinds of I, movies. Yeah, which yeah. is cool. I mean, he's got a great career. But yeah. then Gran Turismo, Gran Turismo is awesome. Oh, yeah. You gotta watch Gran Turismo. It's so goddamn good. It's great. District 9 is excellent though. It's also got great moments of humor. The cat food stuff is hysterical because the aliens love cat food. But it's a great look at what would happen if you became one of these people or one of the, if you became a refugee, if you became one of these aliens because our main character starts to morph into an alien. But then it shows where the alien is much different from us. Maybe they were humans from a, diff, from a different past and a different mm-hmm. reality that came here. So it's, it's a movie that still makes you think about what it means to be human, a human. Human. A human. <laughs> Sound like a robot right I now. I am human. <laughs> I am James Devon. Human. human. Also nominated for Best Picture. Oh, was it really? Yeah. That's I'm, that's rare for a science yeah, fiction film. One of the one of the few on this list nominated for Best Picture. All right, next up, we have a classic from the nineties, starring Jake Gyllenhaal with Donnie Darko, a film we grew up watching. It's an incredible science fiction film, a great mystery film. It's confused audiences to this very day. Uh, I remember when, <laughs> when we made our episode, we got so many questions about it, and uh, we did our best to explain it. It's a very complicated film. Um, it's a really stunning film about uh, not so much the whole multiverse, but another verse. A, a copy. A copy, ver- a copy multiverse. A copied verse of ours. And uh, Jake Gyllenhaal, this is his breakout in my opinion. He was in a bunch of movies. I think this was the big one because although it wasn't very successful financially, it was a huge hit. On on DVD, October Sky was really big. October Sky, too. yeah, but like this was like a cult classic. Like yeah. young people, it they were all about Donnie Darko. It was like everybody rented it, everybody watched it at home. It was a big hit for the youth of the or early two thousands. Watched this all the time when we were kids. We did watch. <laughs> we did actually watch this all the time when we were kids. And it's funny on the surface, it looks like a horror movie, but it's not. It's a straight. It's a very straight science fiction film, a pure sci fi film in my opinion. And it's really brilliant script. Uh, incredible directing, um, a phenomenal ending, and some great needle drops. Uh, some of the best, one of the best needle drops of all time. Couple, yeah. yeah. And it's just and Donnie Darko. It's one of a kind. There's no other film like Donnie Darko. I feel like I'm high when I watch that scene because that needle drops so good. Yeah, it's great. Because it's slow mo. They get out of the back of the bus after they just smoke some weed. Such a great movie. What's so incredible, it's an original script. It's not an yeah. adapted screenplay or anything. It's so well written. It's really, really well made. And I, I really adored Donnie Darko. I, I really connected it when I, with it when I was a kid. Because it's a coming-of-age movie as well. Mm-hmm. And the struggles that you have as a, as a teenager growing up with your family, with your friends, trying to fit in, as well as, you know, I love a precocious kid. I think it's overdone these days. They're too precocious. They're too, like, Donnie Darko is a precocious kid, He's like maybe the smartest kid in the school, but he's not like he's genius. Not like telling t- Tony Stark he's an idiot, <laughs> <laughs> which is like what we get out of precocious kids these days. It's a precocious kid done really well because, but he's, he's also flawed. odd, very he's dark. Flawed. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Donnie Darko. It's a great name too. It's a superhero name. I I, I freaking love this movie. It's a really really terrific. It's, it is. It's an all timer from the nineties. I think so too. Ninety nine. Donnie Darko is it? No, it's not ninety nine. Is n- Donnie Darko even a 90s movie? Is it 98? It's 2001, bro. 2001? Yeah. Oh, my God. Okay, I guess I'm not that old. It's pretty close. I mean, it's only two years away from the 90s, so yeah, you are true. kind of old. The Wally one hit me, man. <laughs> what, 2008? <laughs> yeah, me too, man. When I said that, I'm like, oh, my years. God, 2008? 16 years ago. Wally came out? Damn. What's crazy is it looks better than the last, like, three Pixar movies. It does look great, man. It's because they were making less movies back then. They cared more. Yeah. Well, they still care. I just think that they're they're... They're, they're thinned. Them. They're thinned out. Yeah. They're thinned out. Yeah, they're thin. Stretch. They're, they're not thin. eating. <laughs> they're too thin? No, they're overworking. Shine shoes. They shine shoes? Let's move on to the next on our list at number 19. We have Predator, baby. Predator is one of the best alien movies of all time, one of the greatest action movies of all time. I don't care what you say. We are absolutely putting it on, on this list because we love it. It's just 
exactly what you want. It knows exactly what kind of movie it is. It's just a macho, masculine action movie with 4,000 bullets sprayed, <laughs> giant muscles, flexing and sweating all over with close-ups. We have cigars. We have stubble. We have blood. We have skinless humans. We have an epic, massive alien, and it's amazing. The music's great as well. Alan Silvestri, who we all know from the MCU franchises and Avengers movies, he made an amazing score for this movie as well. I think it's one of the best war movies too, you could say, because it's not it's not a war movie, but it's about this specific special forces yeah. group. Yeah. But man, it hits all the cliches in the best ways possible. It's so fun. It's scary. And the action's just epic. And it's it's Arnold at Peak Arnold. Mm-hmm. This is I think Arnold's best movie. And I think this is the, the ultimate version of Arnold Schwarzenegger is Predator. Yeah, I I, I I this is the ultimate Arnold movie. Ultimate one. And it's perfect. It's a perfect action movie. John McTiernan. Epic director. Yeah, he made Die Hard and he made Predator. Are you fucking kidding me? He no knew way. what he was doing. It is just a perfect movie. It's just flat out amazing. I, I love this movie. And Predator is one of the best aliens ever. Yeah. It's one of the best monsters and one of the best aliens ever in cinema. Yeah, it's one, It's that combination of alien and monster movie uh, that's pretty rare for them being great. And this is one of them. And uh, it's if you haven't seen Predator... Add it to your watch list because it's really that good. Like, and it's a, we, there's a reason why we talk about it a lot on this podcast. Disney, they own Predator now. And obviously, they made Prey recently. They're going to make another one. They'll, I don't think you'll ever come close to this movie. I like Prey. I don't think it's on the same level as Predator. Though. You'll never, you'll yeah. never come close to Predator. It's yeah. that good of a movie. It's a yeah. perfect action movie. It's, it's, it's just, it is what it is. It's just, it's just amazing. It's one of a kind. It's I'm amazing. glad we grew up watching it. Me too, man. Yeah, we watched this a lot when we were Dylan. Kids. Dylan. <laughs> What's the matter? They got you pushing too many fences. <laughs> <laughs> All right, next up at number 18, we have a pretty recent film on this list. Denis Villeneuve's film Arrival, starring Amy Adams, Forrest Whitaker, and Jeremy Renner. Beautiful film, incredibly dramatic, uh, brilliant script, and amazing score, and pitch-perfect directing from Villeneuve in its first foray into uh, pure science fiction. It's a, a remarkable film. Uh, it's a, it tackles great themes, fantastic cinematography. Uh, I, I love the movie. Amy Adams, one of her best performances of all time. And I love the idea of the exploration of uh, of how the language changes Amy Adams' mind, of being able to see. I love when time's explored, uh, not just from time travel, but in this case, uh, time being a circle as opposed to linear. Uh, it's a fascinating thing to think about uh, scientifically uh, and, phys- and with physics, and then it's a, an incredible thing to explore, especially when it's done well. And I think that Villeneuve did a remarkable job of slowly rolling this out to the audience, and he's given you breadcrumbs from the very beginning of the film of what's happening to Amy Adams' character. And then when it comes full circle, no pun intended, in the third act, it is so powerful. It's also one of the rare examples of a science fiction film being a great tragedy as well. Uh, so I think this is a great tragedy. Um, one of the most emotional films on this list. I think it, it could be the most emotional on this list. Uh, and it's just a remarkable piece of filmmaking. I think it's also the best use of Max Richter's On the Nature of Daylight. That beautiful song that's been used in like at least five, six really well-known movies. Yeah. But it's used so well and so effectively in this movie. Plus, Johan Johansson's music's terrific as yeah. well. This movie is scary the first time I saw it I, I because it looks sort of like an invasion movie on the surface. In, in theaters, there was an incredible experience. Very intense. Because the aliens themselves, the heptapods, are terrifying because they're massive and you don't know what they're doing and this mystery of why they're there and the communications there. It's, it's very similar to two other movies you talk about on, the, on this list, Contact and Close Encounters of the Third Kind. It's not an invasion movie. It's a communication movie. And I, I think the suspense is done so well, you know, whether ha- the the communication between the worlds, the the world's powers, the humanity, they can't speak to get t- talk together because we're all enemies, even though we're allies. We we all don't trust each other. And as soon as one person shuts off their screen, everyone starts off starts to shut off their screens, basically. And it shows that humanity, the best future is if we all come together and work together and speak and communicate. And that's really one of the main parts, plots, themes of the movie is communication, and it's so. So good. I so love good. This movie. So good. Visually stunning. Great filmmaking. Also the source of my favorite meme of all time. Which one? Amy Adams holding up the whiteboard and it says, 
English motherfucker, do you speak it? It's <laughs> <laughs> my favorite meme. It's a great one. We did a great episode on it like six months ago. Fantastic episode. It's terrific. Yeah. Let's do two more, then we'll hit our intermission. How's that sound? Sounds wonderful. Next up on our list, we have an A24 film from Alex Garland in 2014. Fuck. Ex, Ten years? Ex Machina, which is a terrific, terrific science fiction film from this century starring Donald Gleason, Oscar Isaac, and Alicia Vikander. Oscar Isaac plays a super genius tech startup gene, uh, inventor. Yeah. And yeah. Donald Gleason plays a coder at his company. He's basically sort of like a, a Facebook or Google kind of company, like a search engine. And he wins a contest to be able to go to this retreat in R&D with Nathan, who is the developer and, and owner of this company, and soon finds out that Nathan is developing artificial intelligence with cyborgs and robots, and Ava is his best invention so far, and Caleb, played by Donald Gleason, is there to see if she passes the Turing test, basically, to see if she has real consciousness, real self-awareness. And this film is really, really terrific because it explores humanity as much as it does science fiction and technology, and it's it's really clever because Nathan, the owner of this Google type search engine, this this company and this this website, has used that to map out an artificial intelligence mind because he's always he says basically, like I realize that everything we search, everything we talk about on the internet, that's the human brain. That's what we are. And he's used that to create a mind. And Caleb starts to fall for this person in this cyborg, Ava. And, and she's played so well by Alicia Vikander. Her big breakout. Yeah, I don't yeah. want to spoil the, the ending of this movie because I'm sure plenty of people haven't seen it. It wasn't a super popular movie. It was like a $35 million box office. But I, I think if you haven't seen this, you got to add it to your list ASAP because it's really terrific. It's got an incredible third act, really great filmmaking, and just a sharp, sharp script. I, I, I love Ex Machina. It, yeah. It's a, a personal favorite of this century in the science fiction genre for me. Great, great film. Great pick. All right, Ember 16. Ember? <laughs> number 16. I don't know what happened to me. At number 16, mm -hmm. we have Interstellar from Christopher Nolan. Uh, it's a landmark science fiction film of the century. It's one of the most beloved movies, I think, of the century. It's something we see commonly in the Letterbox Top 4. It's one of the most beautiful scores by uh, the GOAT, Hans Zimmer. Some of my favorite themes, some of my favorite music to listen to. It's a really great filmmaking Incredible IMAX cinematography from Hoyt of Van Hoytema. A beautiful story. Um, I love traversing these other planets. I love the ideas. I love the concepts. It's incredible to hear the organ. And it's a movie that, like, and it, it's like a movie like 2001 where it ex expand, explores the scope of the universe and the idea of how far we can reach in um, exploration. And I really do think that, like, in the distant future, we'll, th this is the future of the human race is exploring and living inside of space. And uh, I think this does a great job. Uh, incredible use of time. Obviously, Miller's Planet so famous. And I, I, I adore the film. I adore the cast. Matthew McConaughey having one of the biggest years ever for an actor. And then uh, this is just a remarkable performance. And I do think he should have gotten nominated because he's so phenomenal in this film. But since it's science fiction... I can't think of an actor who's been nominated in a science fiction film outside of everything ever all at once. And he's just absolutely miraculous in the film and really carries it. Uh, Nolan knows how to cast his films. And uh, it was like, I remember when McConaughey got cast in, in Nolan's Interstellar. I was like, oh my God, I can't wait to see this. One of my favorite trailers of all time as well. Um, but it is incredible sequences, whether it be uh, exploring, uh, flying across the, the black hole or... Or Tars helping spin that ship. <laughs> Come, Come on, Tars! Come on, Tars! Rotating. Rotating. It's just one hell of a film. It's one of my favorite watches, and it's always going to stand the test of time. And I love how liked it is. Beautifully said, man. Beautifully said. Beautifully. I love Doc. Docking scene is still, on, my, still my favorite scene of all time. I love that movie so, so much. <laughs> all right. Now, we're going to head into our intermission a little bit, but we want to let you know that tickets are for sale right now for our live show in Boston on April 18th at the Middle East. Oh, yeah. Get them ASAP. They're available online. Go to RaidersOfTheLostPodcast.com. It's right there on the homepage, or go to the Middle East website, Middle East Club, and you can find tickets there online. But again, April 18th, it's doors open at, I think, 7 o'clock. 
Six thirty. Six thirty. Seven. Yeah. yeah, it's gonna be a lot of fun. So get those tickets now. Before we continue, though, the best way to support the show, Raiders of the Lost Podcast, is to become a patron at patreon.com slash Raiders of the Lost Podcast. Why the hell would you want to become a patron of our show? Tell us. I mean, first of all, you can support us financially in helping Anthony get his Trader Joe's, help Juno <laughs> get his Meow Mix, all that stuff. you got to pay the rent. He does eat Meow Mix. He eats Meow Mix. <laughs> and also, you get perks. You get access to the ad-free version of every single episode when they post, which is pretty awesome, as well as perks like you get access to our Discord beautiful film community that we've started oh yeah have watch parties on there a couple times a month everyone's on there chatting talking about movies and all sorts of stuff we do fantasy leagues on there too super fun as well as you get private watch parties you get custom episodes you pick a topic we'll do an episode for you patreon is the only reason that we can do this show full time and make the ridiculous amount of content we do for you all every single week so without your support we could not do it also patreon gets a bonus episode every week oh yeah bonus episode of the show oh yeah it's pretty fun Pretty good time on Patreon. You can also support the show by leaving five star ratings and reviews on Spotify and Apple Podcasts at 5,000 Apple Podcast ratings. I will get a tattoo of Anthony's choice somewhere in my body. I had a dream last night I was getting a tattoo and it did not go well. It was a bad tattoo. Sounds like it's a premonition. Uh, I hope not. And it just helps us get seen on platforms. And you know, everyone says you got to do it, but it really does help. It does another, help. another thing that helps us a lot is spreading the word of our show. Share us with your family and friends. Share us on Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, everywhere. We post, repost everything you share. Word of mouth is the best way for a podcast to grow. So let everyone know about our show. This episode, of course, like always, is sponsored by our friends at MoviePosters.com, the number one place to get your posters online today. Be sure to use our promo code Raiders10 at MoviePosters.com to get 10% off your order right now. They have a huge selection of pretty much every movie and TV show imaginable in their poster library. If you love any of these science fiction films and you need yourself a poster, head on over to MoviePosters.com. Get yourself an Interstellar poster. Get an Arrival poster. Terminator. Contact. Minority Report. Everything, everywhere, all at once. They got all of those posters at MoviePosters.com. Our home and our set is decked out with a ton of these incredible posters. High quality. They look fantastic. They're super affordable and even cheaper with our promo code. So be sure to use that Raiders10 at MoviePosters.com to get 10% off your order right now. Now, all right, let's get into our intermission, Anthony. Are you ready for the movie quote competition? I was born ready. All right. Here we go. Little pigs, little pigs, let me come in. Not by the hair on your chinny chin chin. Then I'll huff and I'll puff and I'll blow your house in. That's Jack Torrance in The Shining. Sure is. Sure is. Great pick. All right, here's mine. Sometimes a couple is kind of a chaos and everybody is lost. Sometimes we fight together and sometimes we fight alone and sometimes we fight against each other. That's that just happens. The fuck is that? Anatomy of a fall. <laughs> it's tough when it's a, 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 a new one, an international or different non-English language yeah, film because you're not hearing. Yeah, because you're not yeah. hearing. Yeah. That's a good one, though. All right, Anthony, guess this movie release year. My cousin Vinny. Nineteen ninety-six. Wrong. Four. Nineteen ninety-two. Oh, it's old. Nineteen ninety-two. What year did The Walking Dead premiere on FX? Holy I mean, I mean AMC. We were on. We were in high school. I feel like. Yeah, we were definitely in high school. I think. I'm gonna say. Where are we? What year is it? Oh my god. I'm gonna say 2009. 2010. You were close. close. Very close. We were out of high school. Yeah, just out of high school. What an excellent first season, man. Good stuff, man. First season of that show was that was the juice, bro. <laughs> Holy crap, that show was sick. <laughs> yeah, when John John Berthold, I think, made that show really great. Yeah. Great. No, Andrew great. Andrew Lincoln, though. Oh, yeah, yeah. But he was like a great antagonist. He came out of nowhere in that show, man. Yeah. It was like Oscar Isaac and Drive. I was like, who is this guy? He's mm-hmm. fucking awesome. Next up. What's the, the what's the deluxe version? <laughs> Standard Gabriel. Movie pop quiz time, Anthony. What film did Alan Arkin win his Oscar for? Um Alan Arkin won an Oscar for a Little Miss Sunshine. Nice. Nice. Ding job. ding ding ding. Good question. All right, here's mine. Who adapted The Walking Dead for television? 
Is it a film director? It's a film director. Huh. Huh. Like a well-known film director? Well-known. You love his movies. <laughs> Great. Oh. Or at least you love some of his movies. Walking Dead director. That's a really good question. So he showed around like the first season? Yeah, he adapted it for the TV. Oh, I feel like I remember reading about this recently. I don't know, man. Frank Darabont. Frank Darabont. That's right. Yep. That's right. Because we talked about that in the Shawshank episode. Yep. That last year. That's a really good question. Thanks, man. I thought so too. I just wasn't. <laughs> I was hope. I hoped you thought it would be good. All right, we got some great unsubscribes this week. Uh, so Adam films on our Dune episode, not even two hours long. Unsubscribed. <laughs> it's an hour fifty-eight. We yeah. we almost got there. <laughs> We'd only seen it once. Yeah. Wally Ng wrote on our Asian films episode. Impressed by the actual reasonable pronunciation of all these different Asian names in different languages. Thanks. <laughs> but it wasn't perfect. Unsubscribe. <laughs> we do our best. <laughs> we do our best. <laughs> uh, Ryson wrote, excellent list of our Asian films list, as always. I was listening to this while at work and physically fist pumped in the air like a complete idiot when I heard a bittersweet life mentioned. Unsubscribe for making me look like a fool at work. <laughs> <laughs> Glad to hear you listen at work. We can get you through that work day. <laughs> Christian uh, wrote in our DMs, you actually responded. I will not unsubscribe now. <laughs> <laughs> we respond to everybody in the DMs. Oh, yeah. Caleb Jeter. Except for, except for Creepers. Yeah, Creepers. Caleb Jeter. Banger list on our Asian films episode. But just like the Oscars, y'all snubbed the farewell justice for Lulu Lang and Aquafina. Unsubscribed. Almost made the Great list. Film. Great film. Ryan Desmond wrote, "You better make an Asian top. I, I uh, you better make a top Asian action film list, and Fist of Legend better be on it. I can unsubscribe at the click of a button, bros. <laughs> <laughs> I like the threat. It's a threat. I like the threat. <laughs> that one's great. <laughs> I'll do it. I'll fucking do it. I'll fucking do it. <laughs> Anthony Kern wrote, "I'm having a spice. Oh, I already said this one last week. And blah 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 blah." <laughs> What you got? What you got? All right, we're done. All I right, got them all. Let's move on. I got a great five-star review that let's I'm dying to share. This is from Sigma Taurus. Sigma. Eons beyond all the others. Five stars. It took me time to warm up to these brothers of cinema. I like that. Brothers, brothers of cinema. Brothers of cinema. Oh, that's great. We should have nice. named the podcast that. Brothers of cinema. That would have been a way better name. <laughs> <laughs> I even left a bad review a while back, but eventually I drank <gasps> the Kool-Aid and became a true believer, and they are the only film podcast I listen to. Period. Their love and knowledge of film comes from one single ingredient, passion. And passion fuels everything that is great and outstanding. The podcast is light years beyond any other quote-unquote film pods. It's an incredible thing to listen to. Two people talk about what they love and not what they don't. They're true appreciators of quality cinema and never drift into hater territory. A fun and joyful experience every time I listen. If you're looking for a great time, listening to happy people talk in depth about what they are passionate about, look no further. Wow, Sigma Taurus. Wow. I really appreciate you drinking the Kool-Aid. You know what he you know what they did? They uh they got onto Iraq because it took a while for them to breathe all the spice in until their eyes turned blue. See, I'm not even bringing up Dune. Now you are, now you're bringing up Dune. You're bringing up you bring up Dune more than me, bro. I don't know. I didn't I eat. think you're drinking the Kool-Aid. <laughs> he got that spice. I know. Sigma Taurus. Sigma Taurus got that spice. I understand, you know, sometimes maybe we can be a little boisterous. <laughs> <laughs> James's voice is very annoying. It's not. No, listen, I've. <laughs> my voice is not annoying. It's just not amazing. <laughs> it's just. It takes I've, a little getting used to. I've been told <laughs> I have a great voice by many persons. Like who? All kinds by of two people. people. Too many to count. Yeah, we'll get to that another day. But uh, yeah, that was a great review. I love that. Bro, we have like very similar sounding voices. People can't even tell us apart. That's true. This is true. This is true. This is true. But thank you for the review, Sigma Taurus. I'm glad you're on board. Great review. It was. I love the reviews we've been getting lately. They're so fun to read. Everyone, everyone wants to get a tattoo. Man. Everyone's. I know everyone wants me to get a tattoo. <laughs> Better hurry up. You guys, you guys got to get going. We're only at 2,000. Yeah, got to get to five. 5,000 is happening. What's your streaming recommendation this week? Netflix added a bunch of great movies. Like what? Chinatown. Ooh, good Chinatown's one. on there. It's an all-timer. Get to watch it. If you've never seen it before, it, now's the time. Do it. Bacardi and Cola, do it. Forget it, Jake. It's China. Great quote, man. All right, my recommendation is, that is sarcasm. Port no. It sounded like sarcasm. It looked like sarcasm and it sounded like sarcasm. I don't know you what looked you're at about. me like you're an idiot. 
That's what you looked <laughs> at me like. Is that what she thinks going on I in saw, my head? I saw your eyes, man. You were like, look at this guy. What an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> you have problems. My recommendation is Poor Things is now on Hulu. So if you didn't get a chance to see it in theaters, watch it now. It's fantastic. And I expect to win some awards to, uh, at the Oscars. We're recording this Oscar day, so we don't know who won yet. Not yet. Didn't Not you? Yet. Wasn't this your streaming recommendation last time? No, I did. Uh, I talked about what was new on streaming platforms. Copy. Yes. That was on movie yeah, news yesterday. yesterday. Yeah. I mean, on Sunday. Today's Wednesday. So get your facts straight. Fact check false. I'm doing my best. Well, let's get into the episode. Are you good? I'm good, man. Let's go back to number 15 on our list of the best science fiction films of all time. This is another movie. Oh, actually, we haven't really dabbled into movies that don't really completely deal with aliens technology too much, but A Clockwork Orange from Stanley Kubrick came out in 1971. Now, this is a, it's a debated science fiction film. Is it science fiction or not? I think it is because of the chemical technology yeah. used inside yeah. of it by the third, second, third actor. It of the alters film. the human state. Yeah, absolutely. Now, this came, this movie came out to massive success, critical acclaim, as well as controversy, and it's actually had a resurgence of controversy the last five years, I would say, because of the social media age and the younger generations not accepting this film, calling it a problematic film. Really? It is a dark movie, and terrible things happen in this film. It's a violent movie. I see pretty often, though, that this movie promotes violence, and this movie does not promote violence, does the exact opposite. It uses violence to show that violence is terrible. Mm -hmm. But also... It's a really interesting film because it looks at the effects of society, uh, upbringing, and culture on humans. And can that breed violence? And can you program that out of somebody? So sort of the mass programming of people, can it lead to ultra violence? Can it lead to violence? Or can it lead to no violence? And can you take someone who is insanely violent and then make them repulsed by that violence from means of torture and scientific experimentation, which basically is essentially what happens to Alex in this film. And uh, uh, Ian McDowell is, I mean, Malcolm McDowell is terrific in this movie. It was his, his star making role for sure. And obviously Kubrick's direction is phenomenal. It's based off a, a, a book. It is a dark movie. The first half of this movie, it's, there are scenes that are not easy to watch. It's violence, but it's still referenced today. I mean, it was referenced in, what was the, you were talking about last week. It was referenced in something pretty new. I think it was. Like, oh, it was in um, uh, Batman and Robin. Yeah, Batman and yeah. Robin. It's in. <laughs> Not pretty new, but yeah. Yeah, yeah it, was, it was. It was also referenced in an animated movie recently in like the last five years as well. I believe it was in Ready Player One too. Yeah, I think it was in Ready Player I, One, yeah. possibly, possibly. But this is one of those movies that you know in this era right now, it's it's a controversial movie, especially with this younger generation. You know, this movie depicts terrible scenery of violence and, and assault. And sexual assault and horrible behaviors but it's a really fascinating look at what can be done to the human mind can you take someone who's been incarcerated take them out of prison someone who's a faker someone who's who's lying to get out of jail yeah can you put them in a program and experiment on them to to get the violence out of them by experimentation like i said but does that make them fully human are they no longer kind of like a full human being in terms of a personality and reality and soul it's funny, you hear blowback about a movie like this, but then serial killers are so hot right now. Yeah. And there's no problem with people murdering other people and glorifying that. It's it's just an odd thing that happens with uh, reactions to films like this. It's just people cling to specific things like yeah. this. They cling to Joker. They cling. It's to an the exploration of the darkness of humanity. Yeah. If you don't like it, then don't watch it. That's <laughs> as simple as that. I think it's a, a brilliant film, one of the greatest of all time. It's got an uh, incredible score, too, but just uh, it's, it, it's an... It's a legendary piece of filmmaking, without a doubt. All right, next up, we have another legendary piece of filmmaking. Not only is it one of the greatest science fiction films of all time, but it's one of the greatest action films of all time, and also one of the greatest monster movies of all time. We're talking about James Cameron's Aliens. The sequel to really Scott's masterpiece, James Cameron made his own fucking masterpiece. <laughs> <laughs> if you thought one alien was bad enough, how about fucking hundreds of aliens? A lot of aliens. He and pre... He, he made a new kind of movie, uh, and he created new archetypes, especially like that soldier group, all the personalities you see in an outfit of soldiers and warriors that's been done so many times. I love I love this movie so much. It's extremely entertaining. It's very scary. There are some incredible scares. I think uh, the hospital room of Newton and Ripley being locked in that room with the facehugger is one of the scariest scenes I've ever seen. 
especially as a kid, it was fucking horrified me. Terrifying. And uh, one of my favorite shots ever is when Newt's in the water and the alien rises out of the water behind her. Absolutely stunning shot. Incredible stuff. And the production design's phenomenal. Uh, The action's great. Incredible ensemble cast, uh, obviously led by Sigourney Weaver, who carries the movie like she did the first film in the acting department. Uh, It's just a great, great film. Endlessly entertaining. Uh, It's definitely one of my most rewatched movies. I think I've seen it more than Alien, possibly. Um, It's so much fun. It's an extremely exciting ride of a film. Great finale. And again, it's just a combination of science fiction, horror, and action that's rarely done this well. Uh, It's a perfect action movie. Perfect movie. Speaking of perfect action movies, let's get into number 13 on our list. We have from 2015 from George Miller, Mad Max Fury Road, which is an exceptional action movie, maybe the best of the century. It's up there for sure. Visually stunning, astounding filmmaking, the colors, the aesthetics, the cinematography, the practical filmmaking. Of course, there's some CGI in here, but a lot of what you're seeing on camera in this movie, what you're seeing on screen was done in camera. Incredible stunt work. And this movie took so many months to make in the middle of the desert. And this is, you know, the vision of what George Miller truly wanted to make back in the 80s and 90s when he made his Mad Max movies with Mel Gibson. And it it took so long for technology to catch up to what he was imagining in his mind, you know. And and finally we got to see what's been going on in his head. Obviously the other Mad Max movies are great, but the scope is, you know, they're pretty small compared to this movie. Modest budgets. Modest budgets. Especially the first one. Visually cool, but... This was just a different level. We've never seen anything quite like this before. That's why I love it so much. It's it's such a unique movie. And, I mean, we, we've done an episode on Mad Max Fury Road, and we, we have a prequel coming out of Furiosa 2024. I cannot wait to see this movie. It's one of my most anticipated of the year. Very excited to see. This movie is just so well made. Charlie Theron's terrific in this movie. Tom Hardy's awesome as Max. And, you know, this is going to spawn another reset of franchise of the franchise for him you know he'll be making uh, another movie after furiosa you know i'm sure we'll get a tom hardy mad max movie that'd be really that's excellent. what he hopes to do yeah. yeah that'd be really cool i love this movie it's just incredible excellent plots it's it's just a race the whole time it's a race against the clock it's a chase movie and it's so creative and innovative and wow it, it was a it was just a jaw-dropping film experience it's also one of a kind uh for any film franchise for a movie so late in the franchise this being the fourth one being by far like not even close, the best movie of the franchise to be th- that late in the franchise yeah. and to be exceptionally that good, and incredible editing, incredible visual effects, and like you said, all the stunt work. It's we did a great episode on it. If you haven't seen it, check out our Mad Max Fury Road episode. It's a really fun chat we had. I love it. My 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 world is blood and fire. All right, next up at number twelve, we have Steven Spielberg's E. T. The Extraterrestrial. In my opinion, the greatest coming-of-age film of all time. It's beautiful. It's emotional. It's a resounding piece of filmmaking. Uh, E.T. is just one of the greatest uh, characters ever for, like, uh, an alien. It's just... Snubbed at the Oscars. Snubbed. (laughs) Snubbed. He should have won. Visual effects, special (laughs) effects. It's extremely charming. Very funny. Very cute. Um, But so much fun. Especially the third act, once they break him out and the bike chase and uh, ba, 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 ba. some of John Williams' best music, some of his greatest themes. Uh, it's got uh, it really is a perfect movie. It's got one of the best endings of all time, in my opinion. It's so emotional, and the kid who plays Elliot, what what a performance by a child actor! Incredible, incredible stuff. Um, I love E.T. It obviously influenced many of the science fiction that you know and love today in the modern era. And it's instrumental to the uh, to the genre. Uh, Steven Spielberg, this is definitely one of his most emotional films, ironically for being an alien movie. It's definitely his most emotional. Hey man, there's nothing wrong with aliens being emotional. Yeah, nothing wrong at all. Lots of heart. When the that frogs. Heart, that heart glows. Yeah. That heart glows, man. Elliot. 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 Love E.T. It's incredible. We saw it on the re-release in IMAX. So good. Last year or two Fucking years, 2022. A, yeah. One experience, man. One of my favorite cinema experiences yeah. ever. Dude, when the, ever. the the big drums at the end and then the, 
the symbols smashing and then it cut to black. I was like, fuck, I mean, this is amazing. One of the best shots ever, uh, the silhouette in front of the moon. Yeah. Of flying in the air with the bike in E.T. Yeah. That's one of the best shots in cinema history. Looks great still. Still, still looks, looks great. great. Let's move on to number 11 on our list. We have another Robert Zemeckis film, this time from 1985. We went back to the future, baby. What a film starring Michael J. Fox, Christopher Lloyd. Of just going back to the future, you know, Marty McFly is one of the most iconic characters ever, especially for a teenager, a high schooler. People still dress up as him on Halloween. You dress up on it last like year as Halloween. You still see it everywhere. He's so cool, so charismatic, so likable. And then um, he actually did you see him come out during the it was the Baftas or the Globes. He presented at the Globes. Oh no way! Yeah, Michael J. Fox and the crowd fucking stood up and resounding applause that's how famous this movie is and how memorable yeah. it is like he was he's a great actor and he's had such a great career but this one movie yeah everyone knows you from everyone loves you because of this one movie it's that big of a film back to the future is one of the most incredible american films of all time it's a classic we did an episode on it last year as well but it's just an incredible adventure it's a little weird at times grandfather Par paradox of course but it's interesting. It's fun. It's one of those movies like, what would happen if you went back in time and met your parents? And, mm -hmm. you know, you grew up around there and you're trying to save and yourself. And influence your existence. Yeah, it's, it's crazy. It's so, so goddamn cool and creative and innovative. And it's back to the future. It's just epic. It's a perfect movie. It is. It's fucking amazing. Next up, we're in the top 10 now. Top 10 science fiction films of all time. And this one is a landmark for the century. One of the greatest films of the 21st century. We have Alfonso Cuarón's Children of Men. Uh, which is based on the novel of the same name, uh, starring Clive Owen, uh, Shiva Jafor, and a bunch of great other actors. Uh, Emmanuel Lubezki collaborated with Cuaron to create some of the most incredible dynamic cinematography ever seen in the genre and ever seen in film history. Uh, incredible use of blending long takes together. Uh, great production design. Uh, sound design's phenomenal. Visual effects are perfect. Uh, Clive Owen in his best role, in the best film he's ever been a part of, uh, but ultimately, Children of Men is just such a deep meditative film about humanity, about the future, uh, about the idea of existence and what it means to be in this place. Uh, if you haven't seen it, it's about a world where babies have stopped being born for the last 18 years. And then uh, one woman who is a, a refugee immigrant is pregnant. Well, I wouldn't say babies can't be born. It's just yeah, infertility. Infertility, yeah, yeah, infertility. And it's about humanity except – humanity's reaction to – infertility it's it's about not so much about panic which might be the first idea people way people would react but it's more about this resounding dread and depression amongst the entire population of a uh, lack of hope because there is no future for the race and a lack of trying to do anything and there's a great line where Clive Owen asks his cousin played by Danny Houston why do you do it why do you why do you keep going and Danny Houston just says I just don't think about it. And because everyone else just, that's all they think about, and they've lost hope. Uh, and so this is an incredible film. One of my all time favorites, very influential for me when I was a, a teenager and I saw this when I was like, what, 16, 15? And I just had never seen anything like it before. It's one of the best pieces of filmmaking in the century by far. And if you haven't seen it, check out Children of Men. Another very influential film on this list at number nine, we have Christopher Nolan's. Inception came out all the way back in 2010 and was a mega hit. $839 million at the box office. Damn! 8.8 .8 on IMDb. Absurdly loved. Insanely popular. Groundbreaking filmmaking. So ambitious at the time. So unique. We'd seen elements of this film in, in, in animated features and movies in the past, but to just put a bunch of these concepts together and make it as practical as possible. Christopher Nolan at his best, and this is one of those movies that I, I talk about a lot, how his recent films, because they're so goddamn good, have kind of cast a shadow on Inception. And I think people forgot how good this movie was when it came out and how big it was and how it lived in people's heads rent-free for years, specifically me. Hans Zimmer's music is, is terrific as they well. They referenced it in The Office. Yeah. Michael Scott, is the, after the break, he's like, I saw Inception. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Leonardo DiCaprio, the only science fiction film he's ever been in is Inception, I yeah. believe, yeah. which is incredible. Uh, Killian Murphy in, in roles as well because he's so hot right now. He, he plays he plays Fincher in this movie, but a great great cast. In addition to them, we have JGL, Tom Hardy, Ken Watanabe, Elliot Page, Marion Cotillard, and the great Michael Caine, who just retired this past year. 
But it's an incredible film exploring minds. What if you can put an idea in somebody's mind? Inception. No idea is simple if you have to put it inside someone's head. <laughs> Insanely quotable, very memorable. I love this movie so, so much. Remember when the teaser trailer dropped? Yeah. The teaser trailer was just like the score with the drums and then uh, Leo DiCaprio on the helicopter on the rooftop of the skyscraper and then um, his friend getting dragged away. And it was like, what the fuck is this movie? Some of the coolest action sequences ever, too. Yeah. The rotating hallway is so fascinating. And then just elements like the kick and going deeper into dreams and mm -hmm. different levels of dreams and sort of this very James Bond espionage-esque feel to the film. And you don't see Leo Di DiCaprio very often with guns in his hands in movies. A couple here, like, yeah, Blood Diamond for sure. But then him with a silence pistol in the opening was really cool. Uh, it's just an awesome character as Cobb as well. But and one of the best endings of the century for sure, too. Yeah, it's it really is an all-timer. And it's one of my favorite films. It's one of Nolan's best. And it's really it really solidified his status doing this in between um, The Dark Knight and Dark Knight Rises really solidified him as this is the this is the next big filmmaker in Hollywood for sure. Next up, at number eight, we have another James Cameron film. Third one on this list. T2, Judgment Day. Uh, one of the greatest action films of all time. It could be the all-time action film. I have to watch a couple more, a few more times, but it's sensational. This as, as much as Arnold became iconic as a Terminator in the first film, this solidified his status as uh, a great star. And he was able to showcase his talents, both with comedy and with action and stunt work, and just being the T2 as the hero in this film. Linda Hamilton is amazing. She's one of the best action heroes of all time in this film. Uh, and Edward Furlong is great as young John Connor. Ultimately, he's just another example of groundbreaking visual effects with the T-1000, with the liquid metal. Um, Robert Patrick's great as the new Terminator. It's so much fun. It's scary. It's exciting. Incredible p propulsive action. Great themes explored once again, just as deep and even more deep than the first film. Um, idea of not just the future, if, if you can stop it, uh, but is it right to kill in order to stop it? How far is it? Uh, how far are you willing to go to change the, the events for the future for the better? Um, it's an, an incredible film. It's so exciting. And I just remember as a kid, always enjoying watching this film, just being floored by it every time and being one of my favorite watches. I would say T2 definitely as a kid was one of my favorite movies. Absolutely. Yeah. Anything Arnold was in was yeah. our favorite yeah. movie. <laughs> All right, let's move on to number seven on our list. Oh, nice. And we have a film that came out this year. <laughs> I bet y'all have been wondering, when are we going to put one of these on the list? We have Dune Part 2 from Denis Villeneuve. Obviously, the biggest movie of the year. The biggest movie online right now. Everyone's talking about Dune Part 2. It's hot. It's hot, everybody. It's sensational filmmaking. And we, we chose Dune Part 2 over Dune Part 1 because we think, it, we think it's a superior film. And Dune Part 1 is sensational. You know, it's an incredible, incredible science fiction film. But I, I think Dune Part 2, and we both agree that it just expanded and improved on it in so many different ways in every area. Even though they're very different, you know, Dune Part 1 is very meditative and, and you know, uh, intimate. This one just turns into an all-out war while bringing and maintaining that intimacy and relationships. But, man, what I, – I can't believe how good this movie ended up being. I, I, my expectations were very high, obviously, because Part 1 is terrific. But it seems like Denis Villeneuve – he learned so much from making part one and he adapted his filmmaking techniques to better filmmaking practices for the, for the sequel because there's quite a bit of time between the two because we had obviously the period post lockdowns when this movie came out and people were still unsure of and films weren't really being made for a little while as well as, you know, they had some time during the writer strike and the actor strike to work more on post-production on this. It got delayed five months. And it just seemed like that was just so beneficial to Denis and just making an absolute all-time film. He, he really did with Dune Part 2 in the science fiction genre and just in the century for sure. It, it's a really special movie. I've seen it twice and it, it's astounding. Absolutely astounding. And, and I can't wait to see it again. And we didn't put it number one, number two, number three because we don't we don't like to have recency bias affect our decisions for for – all time lists and stuff like that. But this is a movie that really transcends recency bias because it truly is an all time film. And it's it's remarkable. We did an episode on it last week. You have yeah. to check it out if you haven't. 
Yeah, it's it's an all timer in the science fiction genre, and what the whole crew and Phil Nov and the actors did was nothing short of phenomenal. And it's the best filmmaking we're going to see this year, I guarantee it. We won't see anything top doing part two in terms of the filmmaking landscape. And it's just a, a miraculous achievement of cinema. And it's just so, I was just so excited to see this evolution of uh, Paul's character arc uh, from the first film. And it was, I was not disappointed in uh, seeing him transform into this film. It just, it just, I just kept thinking of uh, Mike, Michael Corleone. And his transformation into into the darkness in this film, and just the cast did an amazing job. And it's great to see Fade Rautha, great to see the princess, great to see the emperor, and it's just so so goddamn epic and beautiful, beautiful film. And the score is fucking great, great score. All right, next up at number six, we have a personal favorite of ours, uh, possibly the greatest horror film ever made, as well as science fiction film ever made. That's really saying something. Doing both of those, we have John Carpenter's The Thing. Starring Kurt Russell and a great ensemble of very talented actors. This was a landmark in special effects and prosthetic work. One of the scariest films of all time. One of the grossest films of all time. But fl- <laughs> a flat out, flat out perfect story. Beat by beat. It's a sensational film. Incredibly well made. So well directed. Every decision John Carpenter did was just the best possible for every moment in scene. Great mystery. On a first time watch, this is absolutely shocking. And then on repeat watches, I'm getting up to about 10 watches on this film. And it just keeps getting better, man. It just keeps getting better. Uh, I love the film. Ennio Morricone's score is phenomenal. Uh, Kurt Russell just being one of the coolest guys ever to be an actor, being being in films. And this is one of his best roles. Um, I, I adore the film. Great ending. Overall, just a really entertaining ride. And it really is as good as everybody says. So if you haven't seen it, add to your watch list. I guarantee it lives up to the hype. All right, we're moving into the top five right now. (laughs) The top five films in the science fiction genre of all time. At number five, you thought we were done with Steven Spielberg, (laughs) didn't you? I bet you did. I bet you're like, oh, there's no more Steven Spielberg on this list. Can't be. Well, you are wrong because at number five on our greatest science fiction films of all time, we have Jurassic Park. Hell yes. One of the best movies from the 90s, our childhood. Jurassic Park was so big for us in bring dinosaurs into the cinema in a great way, in an entertaining way, a realistic way, in an insanely successful way. This is the movie that made Spielberg a billionaire. <laughs> you know, this movie because then the the uh, ownership he got at the parks and everything because of the rides they were putting in there. So Jurassic Park was a massive, massive success. I'm still making movies about it today, but the original is the best one. It will never be topped. It's a great concept and a great story based off the Michael Crichton novel of experimenting with fossils of dinosaurs and also the mosquitoes who have sucked the blood of dinosaurs and that have been trapped in ember for millions of years amber amber did i say amber amber for billions of years millions and millions and millions of years yeah and then (laughs) using frog dna to create dinosaurs again it's incredible and it obviously is it scientifically accurate probably not but is it awesome yeah Yeah, goddamn right it's a great concept goddamn right it is and so entertaining and Practical filmmaking at its best, as well as early CGI with like things like the raptors and the hordes. But a lot of the raptors, in addition to a lot of the dinosaurs in this movie, are still done practically, still done in camera, and still this movie still looks better than any of the Jurassic Park, Jurassic World movies we've gotten. I think it looks better too. The story is excellent. The T Rex scene, man, it, it's so goddamn good. It's funny, it's lighthearted at times, but it's also terrifying and scary and exciting and mysterious. And it's just, it's Jurassic Park. It's, it's also a great it's monster an all-timer, movie. man. Great monster movie. It is, yeah. The T-Rex sequence and then the raptor sequence in the kitchen are two of the scariest sequences of all time. They're up there. Sure, they're up I there. I think for so. Sure, yeah. It's just so brilliant. So fucking brilliant. I love Jurassic Park. At number 4 on our list for greatest science fiction films of all time, we have an absolute masterpiece from a filmmaker who's still kicking, he's still doing it. <laughs> Ridley Scott's Alien which is nothing short of a profound piece of filmmaking and redefined the idea of what science fiction filmmaking can be by creating a monster movie. And Alien, it's one of my all-time favorite films. Uh, Sigourney Weaver is phenomenal. Uh, The Xenomorph is such a brilliant concept and design for a creature. And it's really, really Scott's patience as a filmmaker, his beautiful production, cinematography, excellent score by Jerry Goldsmith, and it's it's one of my most watched movies for sure. 
Uh, there's a reason why it's always on lists of science fiction films because it is that good. It redefined the genre. It reinvented the wheel for sci-fi. And some of the most iconic moments, iconic shots ever in film history are in Alien. Uh, it's absolutely terrifying. Um, incredible special effects, incredible special visual effects. Um, all around, flat out, it's just one of the greatest achievements in the history of cinema. And it's just it's shocking to me that really Scott has made so many great films and then also so many masterpieces. Like, he's made some masterpieces, and this is one of them. Alien is an all-timer. Another all-timer. These are all all-timers. Yeah, we're in the all-timer territory. Now we're in the top three from 1999 at number three in our list. We had a groundbreaking film in the science fiction genre as well as the action genre and visual effects in general. The Matrix from the Wachowskis. You all know how much we love The Matrix. It is that incredible of a film. It's that groundbreaking. The concepts it deals with, the reality of consciousness, of humanity, humans versus technology, man versus machine, different realities, different futures, living in a program. It's just so fascinating and, and it was exciting at the time. And now it's sort of, these themes have been explored quite a bit this century since this movie came out. But man, they really changed the game with this movie, as well as incredible martial arts. Incredible martial arts. The stunt work in this movie is top tier. Some of the best we've ever seen. And honestly, it looks better than most action movies we get these days. Oh, it yeah, really does. it still does. It really does. The wire work's incredible. The stunts, a, a lot of great things happen in this movie. And a lot of people put their lives on the line to make this movie. And it is a very special film. And especially, it's very special to us, you know, seeing this as kids and then... It's one of our all-time favorite films. It's a masterpiece in general, not just in the science fiction genre. And Neo is one of the one of the best characters ever. Keanu is so charismatic. The cast is awesome. Lawrence Fishburne, Carrie Ann Moss, Keanu Reeves, Hugo Weaving is one of the... No one ever talks about Agent Smith as being one of the best villains ever. Agent Smith is one of the best villains in cinema history. Yeah, in this one for sure. A thousand percent yeah. in the first film. He's incredible. But overall, the machines are the villains, so that's probably why he gets in the shadow a little bit. But I, I love The Matrix with all of my heart. You all know it so much, and there's not much else to say. Just watch our episode on it. <laughs> it's fucking incredible. It's always going to stand the test of time, and it's 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 just a great... It's an incredible screenplay, too. What a great script. It's so perfect. I fucking love The Matrix. All right, at number two, we're getting to, like, the, the heavyweights, man. This is, like... What's number two, man? Phew. The second greatest science fiction film ever made in history. I know we just talked about this guy. Ridley Scott made Blade Runner and changed the game again. Blade Runner is a uh, definitive depiction of uh, dystopian future, of tech, of humanity, the, the idea of what it means to be human. Uh, Harrison Ford's phenomenal. It's really just an incredible screenplay. Matched with uncompromising filmmaking, changing the landscape of what you can do with film, uh, and using great miniatures, great visual effects, great special effects, a cool tone. There's a tone to this film that has never been matched before. Remarkable cinematography. Um, Ridley Scott's just always been a visual th uh, genius with his uh, filmmakers as well, um, and it's great action. But it's just there really there's a reason why this movie keeps getting talked about. There's a reason why, you know, the brand and IP is still be, get, being adapted into different things. It's that incredible of a story. It's that sensational of a film. Blade Runner is an all-timer. It always will be. I know that Blade Runner 2049 is by far more popular nowadays, especially with younger audiences. But Blade Runner set the stage for that, and in my opinion, it's still a superior film. I And I adore Blade Runner 2049. We didn't put it on this list. Just barely didn't make the cut. I put in the top 50 of all-time science fiction films. Um, but Blade Runner, I think, is uh, an overall better film. And it's just a special spectacle of cinema, without a doubt. Special spectacle of cinema. I like that. You should make, make a t-shirt out of that. <laughs> all right. It's time for the greatest science fiction film of all time. I'm sure you all can guess what it is by now. I also believe it's the greatest movie ever made. From 1968, Stanley Kubrick made 2001, A Space Odyssey, which was just groundbreaking in so many different ways, from filmmaking, storytelling, uh, effects-wise, visual effects, practical effects. It's bold. You know, a movie like this could not get made today, the style it's made in. 
It's a, it's provocative. It's exciting. It's, it's explorative. It's as explorative as the astronauts in this movie in a lot of ways. One of the greatest cuts ever in history of the bone swinging in the air to the massive weapons ship in space. Really great, great cut. Almost as great as Lawrence Arabia's match cut. Those are the top two cuts of all time. Oh, yeah. Big time. But, you know, what Kubrick did with this movie was, was incredible. He's telling the story of how consciousness came to be on our planet and sort of how humans can be accepted into the world of interstellar life if they pass a test. Basically, you know, this monolith appears on Earth amongst these apes. And it leads to curiosity, it leads to greater intelligence, and it leads to us on a mission to discover more, and we discover another monolith on the moon. And that leads us to an, leads to another clue, and we discover and try to find more about our lives. More and it will lead universe. to another clue! It will lead to another clue! <laughs> 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 Fucking <laughs> national, national treasure. treasure. <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't help myself. No, it's good, that was a good one. <laughs> you haven't done it in a while, so that's funny. It definitely fit. It's so fascinating to 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 try to pinpoint what created consciousness, what created our intelligence, what created a level evolution. Just exploring that with a uh, an object that does not match the the world, our planet is really fascinating. And then humans, curiosity is one of our greatest strengths in terms of growing as a species, as a civilization. That's what leads to exploration of new ideas, inventions, better ways of living democracy whatever you know curiosity leads has led us to all these paths and um just the filmmaking is just incredible you know so many things that you still look at like how do they pull it off how do they pull this off in 1968 well, it's because it. it's it's just one of the greatest achievements and it's it's probably the greatest achievement of directing yeah a film it directing probably is. ever and then dealing with artificial intelligence as well in a computer and humans weaknesses in programming that computer lead to their downfall and eventually, like, the idea of can we be accepted into this interstellar community, mm -hmm. which is basically the end of the film, is being yeah. being accepted into that. And our next stage of evolution, what would that look like? Yeah. This space baby floating in, in space, just ready to take over the planet. I don't think that 2001 can ever be uh, topped. For science fiction? Yeah. And it's incredible because it's almost 60 years old and it still, to this day, holds up as really just the the, the apex peak of what science fiction can a st science fiction film can be i really don't see that it can ever be dethroned as being the king of science fiction i don't think so either it really is the greatest it's one of my favorite episodes we've done too we did it a yeah. while ago like 2019 yeah. i think we did an episode on 2001 long space time. Long <laughs> <time>. <laughs> yeah get 2001 it. man i i can't think of a movie that's better in the genre than 2001 me neither man yeah. me neither not even these other incredible ones that's how good it is that's it, man. That's it. That's that wraps, all she wrote. That's all of our, our best science fiction films of all time list. And obviously there's so many great ones that we didn't put on the list. Sorry if we missed out on some of your favorites. It's not easy to make these lists. It's really not. It takes a lot of work. Because you really want to get a little bit. You have to kill your darlings. Yeah, you do. You, you have, have to, to kill your darlings. Shoot, we shoot, had them right in the we head. We had to shoot Gattaca. We had to shoot Blade Runner 2049. We had to shoot uh, Moon. Yeah, we had to shoot Moon. We had Stalker. to shoot Tron, Sunshine, Under the man. Skin. Man, we shot a lot of we shot a lot of Total drawings. Recall. I love Total Recall. It's too bad. It's unfortunate, man. But you gotta do what you gotta do. And I'm happy with this. I think this is a great list. Yeah, me too. I'm very happy. Man, with talk it. about great films. And we really hope you enjoyed this list as well, everybody. And if there's a movie you haven't seen on this list that you maybe you're thinking about watching, throw it on. I think you'll really love it. These these are all incredible films. Yeah, we can't recommend them all enough. Yeah, they're all sensational. Well, thank you so much for tuning into our episode on the greatest science fiction films of all time on Raiders of the Lost podcast. Don't forget to get tickets to our live show on April eighteenth in Boston. Yeah, yeah, guy. Become a patron at patreoncom slash Raiders of the Lost podcast. Leave those five star ratings and reviews on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. If you want me to get a tattoo at five thousand ratings on Apple, that's gonna happen. And don't forget to share us with your family and friends. Word of mouth is the best way for a podcast to grow. Take care, everybody. See you next time. This episode was executive produced by our Chosen One patrons, Cody Moen, Andrew Hagen, Benjamin Cook, Calvin Murphy Griggs, Darian, Tyler McFly, Mark Nikaj. Our Chosen One patrons are our biggest supporters. Thank you so much. 
Thank you for watching Raiders of the Lost podcast. Be sure to hit that subscribe button, hit the like button as well, notifications for sure. Listen to the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, everywhere you can listen to podcasts. And be sure to check out this other content we have on our YouTube channel.